What's up, home diggity dog? So today we're talking about these bad boys. So if you want to grow some non-suicidally small forearms, you clicked on the right video. So we're going to be talking about anatomy, volume recommendations, exercise recommendations, and how to perform them. And hopefully we can turn your forearms into five arms. I don't regret that. So first, a little bit of anatomy. Now, exercise scientists and anatomists, they usually refer to the forearm as having a fuck ton of muscles in the literature. And it's true. It has dozens and dozens, probably, I just made that up, of muscles. You can see here in the picture, there are a lot of bad guys. So I just loosely break this into three sections. You have flexions, you have extensions, and then you have this, this stuff. The forearm musculature is necessarily complex because the wrist can do a whole bunch of stuff and then the fingers can also do a whole bunch of stuff. So by virtue of being able to interact with the world and type and, you know, hammer down nails and, and grasp stuff and, and do all kinds of human tasks, the forearms are going to have a lot of stuff that they have to do. First of all, I should note that beginners probably don't need specific forearm work. When I see someone who had the size of the forearms that I had when I was a beginner, it's probably like eight or nine inch forearms or something, and they're doing like specific wrist curls and flexions and stuff, it's kind of a waste of time. You're better off focusing on the compound movements. Now, if that's you, keep watching, mostly because I need the watch time. Because it is true that compound movements will absolutely build the forearms, especially this guy right here. Holding on to heavy pull downs, heavy pull ups, heavy rows, heavy deadlifts will absolutely build up that area pretty effectively. I think someone asked Dorian Yates what he did for his forearms, and he's just like, I lifted weights, bro. I think that was his answer, like pretty much just his answer. So he, he never really did direct forearm work, and yet his forearms were pretty developed. And so if you're lamenting over your small forearms, but then you're using straps for everything, even when you could do it double overhand, well, just ditch the straps. Some people say that straps are going to give you the same forearm stimulation. I call bullshit on that, okay? Having something that straps the bar to you is necessarily going to be less forearm involvement. Having to actually hold on to the bar is just going to work that area more. And you do see some people with a big upper arm, so big biceps, big triceps, but almost no forearm. And it kind of looks weird. In fact, I would even go so far as to say that big forearms are more important for how you look and your overall aesthetics. I've even heard it said that forearms are the male cleavage, which, you know, ladies comment below if that's true. But yeah, it, it does look cool if you have a big forearm. And most shirts you're going to wear are going to cover at least part of the upper arm, but the forearms are going to be out there for the world to see and salivate over. So the first exercise is to work on this part right here, and it is a dumbbell wrist flexion. So you basically just pick up two dumbbells, hold them at your side, and then roll them up. You can let them roll down into your fingers for like a, a better stretch. It might be a little bit uncomfortable at first, but just progress gradually and focus on getting as full of a range of motion as possible. It's probably going to be most challenging in that top contracted position, which means that it is a pretty good candidate for going beyond failure. I will typically take these to failure at full range of motion, and then I will keep going until I'm basically just, just doing these little baby reps. That is still effective, and that will still get you jacked. I also like doing it behind the back with a barbell. You can go a little bit heavier on these. Again, pretty similar situation. You can take these beyond failure, even to the point of just going until you can barely hold on to the weight at all. You don't have to go super heavy on this. Sometimes I'll add like a little bit of a cheat with like a shrug or a little bit of a, a hip bounce out of the bottom position. Again, progress gradually. If you're just starting out with these, I would start with like fully strict, full range of motion reps, but over time, you might find that going a little bit heavier and getting a little bit of oomph could be effective. You're also gonna to wanna to play around with the grip width a little bit. Too narrow and it'll probably feel a little bit constrictive. Too wide and you'll probably feel it more in the wrist joint. So there's gonna be a sweet spot 
where it's going to feel perfect on the joints and you can get a good range of motion and it just feels really, really comfortable. And it's going to take a little bit of experimentation. It's going to be somewhere in the middle for most people, but you're going to have to find exactly where you want to grip the bar. You can also find that maybe if you lean forward a little bit, you can get a little bit more torque onto the forearms. If you're super upright, it just doesn't give you the same stretch. So when you're leaned forward, you're actually going to be getting more of a stretch on that forearm. For the brachioradialis, this guy right here, which I like to call the Phil Heath muscle, he has probably the best brachioradialis in history. I don't know what he's been doing. Probably hammer curls, actually. Really, really good movement here. I take these beyond failure as well. I pretty much start every arm workout with hammer curls. Very, very joint friendly, a good way to get blood into the elbows and get warmed up for later movements. And then it's also gonna be working a lot of brachioradialis as well as the brachialis. This dude, I'm not really lean enough, but it's, it's this guy right here between the biceps and triceps. You can also do like across the body pinwheel type of curls kind of thing, but I prefer just to go straight up and down, just boom, boom, amazing. Now in terms of wrist extensions, I like doing these with a barbell as well. You can do them across a bench, so your wrists are on the bench and your hands are hanging off of it and you're just going like this with your forearms. This is gonna work all this meat up in here. It, it does look impressive in, in certain poses, so you definitely don't want to neglect this bad guy right here. Uh, I also find that doing them with the bar in front of you while standing is quite effective. You can lean back slightly. Again, if you lean back, it's gonna be a little bit more stretch on this muscle in that bottom position. And so I find that going to failure and then doing like a little bit of cheat for higher reps is, it's excruciating, but it's also super effective. And I don't think this muscle is trained very well with compounds, right? Like if you're doing a heavy row, you have to hold onto the bar and keep your hand closed, but it's not working this function at all. If anything, when you're rowing, you would maybe be rowing a little bit like this if you're trying to get the weight up. So I would say if you want to isolate any part of the forearm, it's going to be that area. I also find that reverse grip curls are a great bang for the buck movement. Just a tremendous option here. You see most people do their curls like this. Just, you know, pronation station, bro. Do that overhand grip. Yes, you will have to reduce the weight sometimes significantly, but you're gonna be working the arm in a more holistic manner. You're gonna be working the brachioradialis, the brachialis, all this stuff. If you're using a straight bar, I would use a slightly wider grip. If you're using an easy curl, you can maybe go a little bit narrower. Again, play around with the grip a little bit until you find what is most comfortable for you. And I would progress gradually here. If you're getting wrist pain, go very, very light. Use sets of like 15, 20, maybe even 25 reps. There's no need to do like triples or sets of five on reverse grip curls. It's a movement that is better suited for slightly higher reps. Now in terms of volume, the forearms are one of those areas where what you need and what you can handle might be quite different. Maybe you can handle a lot of direct forearm work if you really want to, but do you really need that? Probably not. You're already getting a lot of volume from every row, every pull, pretty much every deadlift, and therefore I would not go overboard with the direct forearm work. You can do it, but should you do it? Probably not, because especially with higher reps, it's gonna be a pretty big time investment. So I would start with just picking a few exercises and doing two to three sets of like 15 to 20 reps a couple times per week. Just hammer it out at the end of a pull day, maybe the end of a leg day if you're deadlifting. Try not to do it before a day where you need to grip something because you know that's not gonna be very efficient. And keep in mind, you can alternate extensions and flexions. So you can do a set of extensions, then a set of flexions, and then back to extensions, then back to flexion. You're not gonna be getting cardiovascularly taxed from forearm work unless you are in like absolutely horrendous shape. You're getting out of breath from forearm work. My God. Now, there are various other exercises that I haven't covered simply because I don't have experience with them and I tend to try to talk about what I know. You can fill a bucket full of sand. And you, you feel it and it feels like a bag of sand when you're touching it. Bag of sand? 
then like try to spread your fingers open to work the extenders. You can do like grip work, gripping weird objects. Rock climbing is probably the best form work ever. If you look at people who are woodworkers or carpenters or who do manual labor, often they have some pretty jacked forearms just because they're using it in a variety of different ways all day. Have like the classic wrist roller where you have a roller and then a string and then a weight and you're basically just moving it up and down. Uh, I've used that I think once before and it definitely gave quite the pump, but it's not something that I've used on a regular basis, so I can't really comment on its efficacy. I've heard the claim that this is as genetically determined as calves. People will say, oh, like I just have genetically small forearms. More often than not, they didn't actually train them for very hard or for very long and weren't consistent or didn't use a good exercise selection or they were doing like sets of eight, which is probably not gonna be that effective for forms. I'm going set eight, set eight. I don't want to stick in that higher rep range. So I would say give it a few years. Now in terms of measurements, you can maybe see I'm right around 34. I think it's mirrored maybe. You can see I'm 34. So when, you're, when your hand is straight out in front with a fist, it's going to be a lot smaller than if you like flex to the side and get an extra a little bit there. And if you flex like this, I'm at like 40, 40 centimeters or more. So keep in mind that if someone claims a huge forearm measurement, you don't know exactly how they measured it in a lot of cases. And you could easily add a couple of inches if you just, you know, do this. I personally recommend just measuring like this because it's going to be more consistent rather than worrying about like where was my wrist, where was my elbow, what was the position, etc. So you're measuring it to see the difference and you want to be as consistent as possible. So measure it unpumped, you know, just flexing like this with your fist closed and that is going to be the best way to do it. Bro fist! It's also worth noting that leanness is definitely relevant here. If you are 20% body fat, you might not have a ton of definition here. Maybe you won't see the vascularity, and then you cut down to closer to 10%, maybe 12% or something, and you'll start getting all kinds of, you know, vascularity and veins and cuts and de definition and stuff like that. So your level of body fat does matter here. So if you enjoyed this video, consider grabbing a copy of my book. It goes into a lot of this kind of stuff in terms of programming, in terms of fatigue management. If you have ever hit a muscle growth plateau, this is how you can get out of this plateau. It has all the details for how to keep making progress in the long term. Thank you so much for the support, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.